getting them ready before the wedding. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, if everybody can uh, mute their mics, please, that'd be um, uh, brilliant because obviously we don't want any feedback or any other stuff. But Mary, you don't have to mute yours, of course. Thank you. <laughs> we'll allow you to keep yours open. Um, I just want to introduce uh, Mary. And as I say, welcome to North Wales Astronomical Society's uh, monthly event um that we, we've been holding here on zoom sadly i still can't get together and it's um it's going to be great when we can and we can all meet up again and uh, and abuse each other in person instead of own little boxes like celebrity squares um but i'm going to introduce a very very good friend of mine um and a excellent speaker and uh, well known in astronomical circles for her drawing which is just unbelievable she still can't teach me to draw though i've got to say that i still can't draw that's her goal in life is to teach me to draw but i did say she she taught kath the other day and that was absolutely brilliant drawing that kath did and colin's done and lots of people have done and she helps out at solar sphere by doing the drawings there as well um, so if you get a chance ever to see Mary's talk on drawing the moon and other objects, please do that. But tonight, without further ado, I want you to put your hands together silently with your mics muted for Mary and a women in astronomy. Away you go, Mary. Thank you. I will just hang on. Let me just start my PowerPoint, which I forgot to do before. If I do that first, Zoom won't open it for me. So um I'll just start the slideshow, then share my screen. Well, it's really nice to be able to do this via Zoom for you because I was originally due to um, do this in person last July, but obviously the world got in the way. Um, so it's really nice to be able to, to come and do this for you tonight. So tonight's talk is all about the history of women in astronomy. And obviously as a female that lo has loved astronomy my whole life, this talk is really important to me. And I'm going to start off by saying when I was growing up, I never once throughout any of my childhood heard from either parent, you can't do a particular thing because you're a girl. And my brother and I shared all our toys together, as much as siblings do without fighting over them. But we had overlapping interests with everything. If I took my prams out, he took a spare pram and his teddies in it. And I think that was a real shock to me when I got to high school age and found out that that actually wasn't the experience for many people. Now, I was born in 73, so I'm actually surprised that I grew up with this kind of upbringing, but um, fortunately I did. But it does make me sad that not everybody has shared, uh, shared that thing in life, really, that it's just about equality. And if we look back in history, um, you look at some of these historic adverts and it's actually quite shocking. This particular one, does your husband yawn at the table? And there's this throwaway remark about how husbands nowadays have stopped beating their wives, but what can be more agonizing than rest of the advert irrelevant? How is it okay to talk about domestic violence in such a flippant way? There's all the, the age old thing about women drivers and sooner or later the wife is going to drive your car home so you better have this car because apparently the bumper on that's really saved the winger from getting crumpled. You know, I, I don't know what they're trying to say with this, but this sort of sexism in advertising has kind of been there for a long, long time and gender stereotyping in advertising is still a huge problem. So husband pleasing coffee, oh, you better choose one of these things for your wife before she cries. You know, all of this stuff is, is, is just there throughout history. And this kind of paves the way for, for this kind of lack of equality when it comes to sciences and, and it's important. And quite often, um, you see oh, a woman can open this you quite often on games uh, toys whatever you see boys playing with their dads at battleships which was one of my favorite games as a child in the background the girls helping mum wash the dishes and smile at how much fun the boys are having while they're doing domestic chores and you know, this this kind of starts to feed into the psyche and um, the one opportunity where there was a female astronaut she was only going to the moon to make it a cleaner place you know what a wasted opportunity and Patrick Moore we all agree is the reason why many amateur astronomers are into astronomy and he was phenomenal one of the best scientific communicators that's ever existed but it's absolutely well known that he was not a fan of women being involved in astronomy and things like the boys book of space um 
it really just kind of makes girls think that this book is not for them so they shouldn't read it I was lucky I never saw any books that were labeled boys books of space but even if they were I would have ignored that and read them anyway but when you see this over and over again it starts to drip into the way that you think about yourself as a female I went through all of my kind of young adult lives with my friends emailing blonde jokes to me on a weekly basis not just once but regularly and it starts to really get to you when you keep being told you can't have any intellect because of the color of your hair you start to believe it so this stuff is important and I think I'm going to come back to some of that throughout this talk and when I talk about this stuff it's not from a feminist perspective at all it really isn't it's just about trying to give things a level playing field and we definitely are not there yet. Now this is a famous quote. Um, Jean-Jacques Rousseau commented, women do not possess sufficient precision and attention to um, succeed at the exact sciences. This was just a well-believed statement. It, it was just everybody assumed that to be true. And generally, historically, female astronomers were not allowed to report discoveries, they were not allowed to communicate directly with other people. So quite often, historic stuff is written to the husband of the lady that was doing the work because it just wasn't acceptable to write directly to a woman. On the lunar surface, we have lots of named craters, 1,605 of them to be exact, and only 29 of those are named after women. And tonight, the, some of the women I talk about, I'm going to show you a picture of the craters so you know where to look for them next time. But a lot of those are on the far side, so we can't even see them. And if we look back through history at people in senior jobs within physics and astronomy um, within the UK, there was a roughly 11 to 1 disparity male to female. Luckily, there are a lot more people lower down and hopefully that will filter up. But as we go through, I'm going to point out some of the issues that we have. Now, there used to be a 4 to 1 ratio men to women um, at the Harvard and they introduced sex blind application processes and it ended up being 50 50. So what this tells us is that there is whether it's conscious, possibly, but more likely there is an unconscious bias there. So these people that are kind of interviewing people or looking at applications, there is definitely something there that is putting them off giving the go ahead to females. Whether it's just because it's an unknown entity, I, I don't know. I'm not in the heads of these people, but th this unconscious bias definitely does still exist. And this was true with the time booked on the Hubble Space Telescope. So the Sci Te Space Telescope Science Institute in Maryland runs the booking there. And they did a study of a dozen review cycles over 12 years, starting from 2001, and it overwhelmingly showed that proposals led by a male project lead were more successful than the ones with females. Again, I don't think this was a conscious, oh my God, we can't let women have time on the telescope. It was probably more to do with the fact that there are these people that have been in senior roles within astronomy for many years. So you know that they're trustworthy, you know that their science is sound. So you just tend to go with what's familiar. Um, and I, I suspect there's a big element of that going on. But they trialed anonymous proposals. It wasn't just sex blind, it was completely anonymous. They didn't know where the institute was that were applying for time they didn't know who the lead was they didn't know any of the people in the team and then what happened during that trial is that the outcome was a 50 50 male female split so again evidence here of unconscious bias somewhere so it's important to keep that in mind now it's kind of well documented that caroline herschel was the first professional female astronomer and we are going to come to her. She is somebody that I deeply adore and would very much love to go back and talk about. And we will get to her. But I was asked to write an article on um, women in astronomy and male mentors for women in astronomy, a bit like Caroline and Williams. Um, relationship was for the yearbook of astronomy 2021 and when I started digging into this I was able to trace back female astronomers that go way back before Caroline Herschel so then the majority of the people that I'm talking about tonight are not the ones that you may have already heard of from history they date back to before Caroline then there are a couple of people I'm going to mention after Caroline bef before I do some finishing bits and pieces so first of all one of the oldest known cultures in Mesopotamia are the Sumerians and they used to 
write literature on these clay tablets and a lot of it still exists. There was an absolute abundance of literature written in this form. These date back around 4,300 BC from what I can find. And there are just so many of these that have been preserved. So we know that this exists. And around 2000 BC, 2500 BC rather, um, schools were built with both male and female teachers. So this tells us that like way back in history, females were respected enough to be able to teach in schools, which is really good. And one of the earliest kind of females that we know to have been an astronomer, as astronomy existed back then, was N. Hedu Anna. And one of the types of things that she would have been responsible for was making these sorts of calendars. So this is what an astronomical calendar looked like on these clay tablets. Now, she was the daughter of an astronomer, um, chief astronomer and priestess. Priestess. Um, so there was this daughter of Sargon of Akkad. And so she was actually a very educated lady. She was very, very talented. She actually managed the huge temple complex in the city. So she obviously had power, she had brains, and she was obviously well respected by her community. And definitely part of that job would have been knowing the uh, the moon and the stars and the relative positions of all of them um, because in this part of the world the position of those celestial bodies was really important to um, the culture so this is the type of thing that En Anna would have been producing and a lot of these do survive whether they are the ones that she specifically wrote I don't know but we do know that they exist going way back in time so it was a real surprise to me that this lady existed so far um, BC and was kind of doing this and probably teaching astronomy to people, which is amazing. Obviously had a supportive um, male relative there. Another one still um, BC period, kind of round first to the third BC was Agalonice or Agonice of Thessaly, sometimes um, she was known as. And she is um, rumoured to be the first female astronomer in the Western world. And she was able to very accu accurately predict lunar eclipses. So she obviously had the knowledge to know that Saros cycles existed and she was able to predict these. And in literature, it has been written about her, um, this reference as the moon obeys Agalonice, as though she herself had some kind of sorcerer powers and could command the moon to do as she told it to do. So this is a, a bit of an example of where somebody has obviously got a great amount of intellect and it's I don't know whether this was intended to be offensive or not, but certainly there have been things written about females that succeed in that are um, kind of a bit rude um, that I'll point out as we go through. But yeah, that it was well known that she understood the lunar cycles well enough to do them. Now, she ran a school for female astronomers, which is awesome, but the community then nicknamed them the Witches of Thessaly. So whether this kind of mention about the moon obeying her was meant as some kind of sorcery nonsense, who knows, but calling them the witches of Thessaly is definitely an insult and you know, not particularly nice, to be honest. Um, just because there are these learned women, you have to call them witches because you know, people are feeling insecure, maybe, I don't know. So even way back then, um, in this time in history, women were getting a hard time for doing what they obviously loved and were good at. Another person that's kind of a bit further forward, born around about 350 AD, is Hypatia of Alexandria. And this is a really interesting one when we come to the lunar craters. Now, she was a great mathematician. Um, she was from Egypt and she had a huge amount of influence over the political elite. And her father was the head of a school and she actually taught philosophy and astronomy at that school. And her disciples, as they were called, included people that were very senior in the political system. Now, she is known to have built astrolabes. Some places credit her with inventing them, but she definitely didn't invent them, um, but she definitely built them. And if any of you ever do get the chance to come to Oxford, Oxford's history of the museum, uh, the Museum of the History of Science, I keep getting my words back to front, and um, the Museum for the History of Science in Oxford has got the most phenomenal selection of astrolabes, and the Islamic world really knew how to build a beautiful astrolabe. So um, definitely go and check that out when we're allowed to 
go out again. So she was building these scientific instruments as well as using them. Now, she herself was pagan, but she was very tolerant of Christians and any other religion that she came into contact with. Unfortunately for her, because she was, I think she got embroiled in some, some political debate she'd given advice to somebody and it was then seen that um, she'd kind of gone behind somebody's back and she was caught up in some drama and a mob of angry Christians murdered her now because of that she ended up becoming a martyr for philosophy and that ended up then in the 20th century, she became an unintentional icon for women's rights and the precursor to the feminist movement. So Hypatia's name is kind of well known when it comes to kind of feminist type stuff. Now, the legend of St. Katharina, which is a Christian martyr, all of the life of St. Katharina is thought to be based on Hypatia's life, um, which I find quite ironic given it was Christians that killed her. But, but yeah, um, definitely it's thought that Katharina was um Hypatia now what's interesting is that Hypatia and Katharina both have a crater named after them and I think it's really entertaining that the um <laughs> the mythological figure that wasn't an actual person gets the way bigger crater than um the one up here which is Hypatia this is the Theophilus trio so you see that um, quite well when the moon is kind of just past a thick crescent and getting towards first quarter so good on Hypatia she ended up inadvertently having two craters named after her which is pretty cool now when we get into the middle ages this was actually a really bad time from a science point of view anyway because everything that was seen heretical was burned so the library of alexandria was burned lots of other materials were destroyed and a lot of ancient knowledge was lost so this was a really bad time but as well as the knowledge being lost there was a cultural shift which meant women started to be excluded from social and cultural life and it's something that I think we've never fully recovered from in many ways, this, this shift towards excluding women. Now, women were still definitely involved during the Middle Ages in science and maths, and that's really good. And there were definitely scribes and teachers in monasteries and convents. If any of you have ever seen Alan Chapman talk, you'll know that there were, there were a lot of religious people that were responsible for teaching astronomy to the masses. Um, so in today's kind of society it's hard to imagine that religion and astronomy would go hand in hand but definitely in monasteries and convents people were teaching the sciences now so we move on to Hildegard von Bingen I love this picture of her um, with the, the kind of dude over her forehead I'll explain what that is in a second but she was born in um, 1089 and she was a Benedictine abbess. She was also a writer and a composer and a philosopher. So she was another well-rounded, well-educated um, lady. She was actually the founder of scientific natural history in Germany. So that, that's a huge thing that, um, that she achieved there. And obviously Germany was very good at the sciences, still is, and that kind of kept going. Now this is an illumination from the Livre Scivias and it shows her receiving a vision and dictating to a scribe. So as well as as the, the kind of philosophy stuff that, and this natural scientific um, history the stuff that she used to teach. She also did a lot of work on visionary theology. So she would get these visions which um, are depicted by the, the kind of chomped up fly curtain that's coming down over her forehead. Uh, but then she would um, obviously dictate those to a scribe who would write them down and then she would publish them in books. I've no idea what the source of these um, visions was, whether she had some kind of migraine, whether she was making it up, who knows, but she was known for visionary theology as well as physics, which is, you know, is not something that we would see today for sure. Also around the 10th century or 11th century AD was Fatima of Madrid. And she lived in Angelasia, which was um, controlled by the Muslim Caliphate. And she lived there with her father, who was an astronomer. And her father actually founded a school for maths and astronomy. And if you know anything about Muslim culture, you'll know that they were responsible for a lot of scientific advances. And as I mentioned earlier, the position of the moon and the stars and of the celestial bodies is really important to them. So kind of astronomy was really crucial to, to the center of their culture. And she was just one of them. And what they did was actually correct a lot of astronomical tables. Now, remember at this point in history, there were astrolabes, but we didn't have magnification. People 
people were not able to see the night sky any other way than with the naked eye. And actually, if you've ever done any just like straight constellation drawing, it is incredibly difficult to get the stars in the right position. So there's lots of data that would have been slightly incorrect and planetary tables that would have been incorrect. So her and her father actually corrected all of these calendars and tables and all of this stuff and published them and they were called the corrections of Fatima so there were several books published there on that um so yeah she was obviously another very bright lady who I'd never heard of until I was researching for this article and also when I was digging around that period and um, there's this illustration from a medieval translation of the principle of Euclid which is circular uh, circa 1310 and this is actually showing in women teaching geometry so the, the calipers and the set squares protractors all of that stuff is showing that women were teaching mathematics to lots of other people so that's really good because if, if females hadn't been teaching at that time it wouldn't have been put in a stained glass window so really good that we have this to to know that women were still kind of doing work that was really good now, during the renaissance there was another slight shift again and women became more involved with poetry and also female interest in science and politics and music all increased. Some of these subjects were deemed suitable for women, some were not quite deemed suitable, but um, it's good that women were getting included again with quite a lot of other things. Now, during the 16th and 17th centuries, there was a huge scientific revolution and women definitely were then getting into science, but they were still forbidden to actually attend university and get an ed formal education of any sort. And back in that period in the 16th, 17th centuries, 14% of astronomers were actually women. So we do know that there were a lot of women working in these fields, probably unpaid for a, a lot of it. And in order to overcome the, the issue of not being allowed to go to university, many people had to be educated by their fathers, grandfathers, uncles, cousins, or just friends of the family. But usually it was a male relative that was kind of helping them along. And that was the focus for the yearbook articles was this male mentor relationship to help some of these early women kind of get on their way in astronomy. Now, I've already mentioned Caroline and William Herschel, when you talk about famous sister brother relationships, you immediately think of those two. But I was astounded to find out fairly recently that Tycho Brahe actually had a sister, Sophia, that helped him with his observations. I have read a lot about Tycho Brahe. He's one guy I would so much love to go back and have dinner with because he sounds like he would be amazing company. But I had never once heard mention of the fact that his sister helped him with his work and anywhere. I'd just never seen it anywhere in anything that was about him. Um, so she was the youngest sister. So they didn't actually grow up in the same household. She was um, very, very young. He'd already grown up and left home. But they were very, very close and had a lot in common. And she was passionate about astronomy from a very, very young age. And by the time she was 10, she was already assisting him with his work. And if you've ever read anything about what Tycho Brahe did, it, the observatory that he built was phenomenal given that he was the last great naked eye astronomer. He had all, I'd love to go and visit there, It's a, you can actually go and visit I think in um, Denmark, but he had all of this incredible equipment for really precisely measuring the positions of stars which had never been done before and she was helping him with all of this which um, I say had never been recorded anywhere that I knew of. Now their parents were obviously against this from the point of view of Sophia learning it but also him because these were people of nobility they were a very wealthy noble family and it just wasn't deemed appropriate for people to do science and astronomy for people of their standing but they did it anyway um <laughs> now Sophia really wanted to study at university but obviously couldn't get an education at that time so she did learn a lot from Tycho she calculated eclipses and cometary paths and she was actually the first person that accurately measured the position of the planets and I've only ever seen that um, credited to Tycho before I, I found this stuff about Sophia when she was married, as was common through quite far, well, actually until fairly recent times, once a woman got married, it was assumed that they wouldn't be working anymore. Even though she was probably working for free, she had to give that up. Um, unfortunately, her husband died when he was still quite young. But the plus side of that meant was that she was able to then go back and start 
carrying on the work that she was doing with her brother once her husband had died. Um, so these, we still kind of have this issue where it's expected that women do certain things when they get married. And right up until recent years, that was a thing. So this was obviously alive and kicking in the 1500s. Now, Maria Kunitz was born somewhere around 1607, and we know she died 1644. Now, Maria Kunitz was taught many, many subjects by her father, but although her father had a, a slight interest in astronomy, he didn't really know that much about it. So he enlisted the help of the am local amateur astronomer called Elias van Loewen, and he taught her all about astronomy. And this is um, the first example I can find of where somebody um, ended up marrying their astronomy mentor. And I don't think there was anything untoward happening here. I think this must just genuinely have been very refreshing for a, a female to be accepted that she wanted to do this work and for the guy to have a female that was kind of on a similar intellect level. You can imagine these guys were going to click the way it was when I first met Mark. I, you know, Mark, people will often ask me, did I get into astronomy because of my husband, Mark? But no, I was into astronomy long before I met Mark. But that mutual love of astronomy is what helps get us get on so well so I think this was just something that happened a lot because of that so I don't think there was anything untoward happening with this mentoring system um, but they ended up getting married in 1630. Now she um, didn't have a lot of money and astronomy equipment back then was phenomenally expensive as it was right through the Victorian period so because of the fact she was hindered by good quality equipment she just applied her math skills instead and hats off to her I would not know how to apply my math skills to do anything beyond calculating the lengths of um, crater shadows to find out how tall something is on the moon that's about the extent of any maths that I'm able to, to pull off and she published some more um, corrections here in 1650 and that included corrections in um, Kepler's tables um, so clearly a very very bright mathematician and this lovely bronze bust um, stands in a hometown there if you ever go to Poland um, it's really nice I love this quote and I love it so much because it could totally apply to me so Johann Kasper Alberti and and probably many other guys were probably slightly spun out by the fact that she was up at night observing. So he wrote that Kunitz was so deeply engaged with astronomical speculation that she neglected her household. The daylight hours she spent for the most part in bed concerning which all manner of ridiculous events have been reported because she had tired herself out from watching the stars at night. What the heck the concerning all manner of ridiculous events means who knows but obviously if a woman's in bed during the day she must be up to no good or it could just be that she's really tired because she's been doing astronomy all night now, there's no way if I've been out observing till six in the morning that I'm then going to get up at seven and do the cleaning just never going to happen so I, I find this quote very very amusing and clearly some of the people that knew the this couple were slightly um blown away by the fact that she was actually out at night and this is um something that you see even when women were professionally employed to be astronomers they were never expected to work at night there were very few early female astronomers that were paid that actually worked at night they were all analyzing photographic plates or spectra or stuff like that during the day so yeah it, it's quite interesting now elizabetha kuthman hevelius she was somebody else that loved astronomy from a young age i think us women that love astronomy know by the time you can read that it's something you love and that was the case with her now she approached Johann Hevelius when she was very young um, Hevelius was a, um, he'd gone through law school his family also owned a very successful brewing business and the brewing business has funded the purchase of amateur astronomy equipment for many many years and certainly back through the Victorian period because you now this stuff was expensive you couldn't go on Amazon and get an affordable telescope back then this stuff cost a lot of money so it was generally people that had a, a good kind of means behind them and brewing was definitely a good way to do that now when she first approached him he thought she was too young and he promised to show her the wonders of the heavens when she was older uh, I think we'll find out that that is exactly what happened and <laughs> um, she actually did approach him again when she was 15 and at that point he did actually 
take her on and they started to to learn together you know when I first found this particular photograph I really struggled to know which was Johan and which was Elizabetha and I'm still not fully sure that I know but um <laughs> One of the things Hevelius was actually famous for was building this monster 140 foot long refractor. This gave a 40 times magnification, which must have been just unbelievable. But just look at this thing, the all these guide ropes to try and stop the tube from flexing. I just, I can't imagine what people around the area must have thought when this thing went up. And, and it'd be great to just build one for the crack and see what it looks like looking through it. But, but it, yeah, you can see why this was famous famous and people wouldn't have seen much that looked like that in the past so it was quite cool but I really love this quote as well when Elizabeth very first looked at the moon through um, Johann's big telescope um, E.F. McPike wrote this quote and when in the starlit night she followed with enraptured gaze and beating heart through his giant telescope the shining full moon on her silent path she exclaimed with enthusiasm to remain and gaze here always to be allowed to explore and proclaim with you the wonder of the heavens that would make me perfectly happy and the worthy man felt it might make him happy too and they did end up getting married but this quote is amazing because I remember being 11 and getting my first telescope and pointing it at the moon and having exactly that reaction and even now we don't very often get our 10 inch reflector out but when we get that out and I look at the moon through it so much that it hurts your eyes I still have this kind of enraptured gaze I'm like wow it's so beautiful and that just has never left me from that first time seeing it when I was 11. So I really like this quote. I think it's really beautiful. And when she was 16, she did marry Johan. Um, there was a big age gap there, but she ended up becoming his assistant. So great, if you're going to want to work in astronomy and history, marry an astronomer and become his assistant, because then you can keep working. <laughs> you marry anyone else they'll make you stop but it was really good that she was able to work alongside him and as well as working alongside him like a lot of these women through history she did a lot of her own observations and important calculations as well so it wasn't just kind of helping the husband now obviously he died before her because there was this big age gap but once he died she actually prepared three of books of his and her works for publication and the, the books almost certainly contained stuff that they both worked on together. So now we move on to Maria Marguerite Winkelmann Kirsch. She was born in 1670. Now she was born in Germany and her father and her uncle were huge advocates of education for women. So that's great. So she had a, you know, she had them looking out for her there and were willing to teach her. She also became an apprentice of Christopher Arnold and through him, she met Gottfried Kirch. Now Gottfried was kind of a famous guy. Everybody knew him. He was like Germany's best known astronomer so they ended up meeting and ended up getting married in 1692. Now she became his assistant where he worked at the Berlin Academy of Science and together they would do calendars and almanacs which was just like the bread and butter for any astronomer throughout history. They were calculating planetary positions, predicting eclipses, all the usual kind of stuff and she actually became the first woman to discover a comet um, in 1702. It had to be credited to Gottfried because it was just not allowed for a woman to report an observation, that a, a discovery. So it had to be credited to him. But it was definitely her that actually discovered it. Now, she was held in extremely high esteem by everybody that she worked with at the academy. But when he died, they cut her loose. She begged them to be allowed to stay and work there. And they were like, no, not having it. You're a woman. And then they said, well, can my younger son come in and I work for him instead? No, not having it. They just completely cut all ties with her, which is absolutely shocking because she'd already proved herself. And she fought to enter the Berlin Academy, but was denied because she was a woman and had no university education. Well, nobody had a university education who was a woman. She'd already proved herself and they feared she would set a bad example. And oh, that is just so frustrating. And what's really sad is she did end up getting work elsewhere in private observatories, but the sexism was so bad that she was eventually forced to give up and she just had to give up working in astronomy altogether for other jobs. Now eventually her son was allowed to become an official observer there um, but they would never let her daughters join. Um, so this story just makes me so 
bad for her, but also really angry in equal measure because <clears throat> it's just so unfair that they did that, having already proved herself. But it probably happened many times over. Now, Maria Clara Imart um, was the daughter of a painter and engraver and also the daughter of an amateur astronomer. And that was George Christoph Imart. And um, because he was a painter and engraver, that was a very well paid profession. So, again, he had means behind him to be able to, to build a private observatory. So between, her father funded the observatory and, and basically Maria became his apprentice at the observatory. Now he taught her everything he knew about painting and engraving. So naturally she became very well known for basically drawing what she was seeing through the telescope. So she made engravings and IP sketches of, of all the stuff that they were looking at from their observatory. And her sketches are phenomenal. I'm gonna show you some in a second. Now, she ended up marrying a guy in 1706 who was not an astronomer. He was Johann Heinrich Muller, and she inspired him to get into astronomy. So I think that's great. Um, it's the, uh, normally the other way around. So I think it's really awesome that her love of astronomy inspired a guy to, to take up the subject as well. Now, these are some of the, the sketches that she did. She did a lot of them with pastels on these blue boards, and I really keep meaning to buy some dark blue cardboard so I can try and do some of this myself. These these sketches were so detailed that they actually used them to put together a topographical map of the moon because she would just did it in such exquisite accurate detail they were just phenomenal and these sketches are gorgeous there's lots of them online if you go and google that but as well as the moon she also was looking at Saturn and she's obviously recorded lots of um, different phases of Saturn here or the way that it looks with the rings tilted differently also cometry um, morphology she's recorded a lot of and phases of Venus. So she was looking at everything. It wasn't just the moon that she was doing. And this is my sketch of Comet Neowise last year. I put it on a blue background so that it looked more like um, Maria's sketches. And these are some of my pastel sketches as well. That um, So one of the reasons I love sketching so much is because you feel connected to the people that did this in the early days because that's all they had they didn't have a canon 1100d second hand for 100 quid you know they they had to draw it and you know i i hope these ancient astronomers that sketched look down and are pleased for those of us that are kind of still sketching and trying to promote sketching Okay, this is a name I'm going to say once because I am not a native French speaker, but Nicole Rienne Table de la Brière Lepeté. Um, she was born in 1723. She was an astronomer and a mathematician, and she was helping to construct a clock that had an astronomical function to it as well. And she was actually one of the people that helped to calculate the return of Halley's Comet in 1759 apparition um, with a guy called Alexis Clairault. And he he completely failed to recognize her contribution towards this. This is a, an early example of the Matilda effect that I'm going to talk about later, where a male takes all the credit for something a female has done. But yeah, definitely that's what happened here. But she was involved with the design and the construction of this clock. So it was really unfair of that. She was a member of the Scientific Academy of Bézier for her work on Venus transits, and she also produced star catalogues. Um, I find it incredible that people had the patience to produce the star catalogue. I mean, I, I can spend hours out there looking at the sky, but to actually record every single star that I can see, not only naked eye, but through a telescope, that takes some dedication. So I really admire the women that, that did this stuff. Um, she does have a lunar crater named after her. And if we look down here, I think it's that one. It was actually, when you look for people's craters, Wikipedia shows you a super high res version from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter and rarely gives you your bearings. But I think this is Crater Lepete and this is the, the LRO picture of it with all the, the little craterlets around it. But I, th I think that's where it is. So at least it is near side, even if it is tiny. So now we come on to Caroline. And she was the youngest of eight children, and she actually got her love of astronomy from her father, not from William. Obviously, William had an interest in astronomy, but her dad also did. And it was her dad who took her out to look at some constellations and showed her a comet when she was very young. So definitely the, the spark of astronomy would have come from her father. Now she contracted typhus when she was 10, so that stunted her growth. So she ended up being four foot three in height, and she'd also 
pretty much lost the sight in one eye. Because of this, her family just expected she would never get married. And this makes me sad. I'm currently almost at the end of reading her memoirs and letter correspondence that I've um, that Mark bought me for my birthday and I just feel so frustrated on her behalf because she was an amazing person and she would have made an awesome wife and been a great challenge for anyone to take on but her family just basically thought she's never going to marry we're just going to have her as the free domestic help around the house now her father did educate her but her mother very strongly disapproved of this and she pretty much did everything she could to prevent Caroline not just learning about astronomy and science but learning anything beyond the very basics that would involve her bettering herself and then leave the family because she could go and get a job as a seamstress or whatever all Caroline ever wanted in life was to be an independent woman and her mother did everything she could to try and prevent that from happening so it, it was really frustrating so her father and her brothers would educate her when her mother was away so that she didn't know or she would study late at night when all the chores were done but her dad also encouraged her to study the night sky and when she was 14 he gathered all of the family around a bathtub full of water so that they could observe a solar eclipse this event was very important to Caroline and she actually does talk about it in her memoirs with a date and time attached to it so it was obviously something that had a lasting impression on her and as anybody has actually observed a solar eclipse she would have the same reaction have Dad actually died quite young and William and Alexander then asked Caroline to join them to move into Bath with them to become a musician. So over time, there's been much written about how William saved her from this life of domestic servitude, this Cinderella existence, and he took her away to, to be a music star. And um, But when I read the Comet Sweeper, there's quite a lot in there that when they've dug through the history, where actually William was so busy a lot of the time, and it seems like William was very tunnel visioned when he was onto something, that Caroline ended up with the music stuff having to teach herself a lot of the time and there's a lot of this kind of frustration from her part that all she wants is for him to teach her this thing then she can go out and have a successful music career and later on learning to be a good astronomer but always this frustration because once she got to Bath she ended up doing the, the accounts for them she was the housekeeper and there's some stuff written as well that some of her brothers would deliberately bring people home late at night so she had work to do where she would have been able to study otherwise and not all of her brothers were supportive of this kind of getting her out of the domestic situation thing but that said she did end up becoming a very successful singer but by the time she became a successful musician William had already moved on from music and into astronomy so she kind of fell into being his um, assistant so that that was a natural progression but she was an absolutely amazing astronomer in her own right and not only helping William with observations and looking after him because William would sit there for 18 straight hours without so much as eating or drinking and there are reports of her literally feeding him putting food in his mouth because she couldn't make him stop doing what he was doing and he definitely worked himself very very hard but as well as that she actually ground and polished mirrors she would mount telescopes she recorded all of William's observations but also had her own sweeper telescopes to go out and look for comets and do all of these other observations that she recorded meticulously and she just worked so hard and yet when you read her memoirs she has no recognition for the amount of work that she was actually doing herself she says I was nothing better than a puppy dog she just it's this really weird dichotomy with she really wanted to be an independent woman with her own means but at the same time she would do anything to just be the best person she could to look after William so it's this really kind of strange thing but she didn't believe herself to be anything special at all now she made her first discovery in 1780 is what we now know as M110 um, um, and she also went on to, to discover eight comets. She also became the first woman in history to be paid for doing her work which is huge. This basically changed the landscape for all future women in astronomy and 
it's amazing and I just wish that she knew the impact that she was still having on people today myself included the more I read about her the more I love her and she was actually the first woman to be awarded the gold medal for the Royal Astronomical Society and also they were named honorary members her and Mary Somerville were named honorary members of the Royal Astronomical Society in 1835 um she would awarded the gold medal for science by the king of prussia now a lot of these accolades came later in life when she was back in germany and actually not doing a great deal of actual astronomy anymore and she just didn't feel that she was worthy of any of these accolades and it's kind of like i wish she could just for a day see herself through our eyes and know just how amazing she was and what she paved the way for because I don't think she had any appreciation for how great she was. Now she does have a crater named after her and that's up here near um, Sinusiridum and it's this one here. So it's a decent sized one, easy to find because it's along this little ridge. Now there was this painting of her really, really irritates me because she was such a phenomenal astronomer in her own right. And not only have they painted her about a foot taller than she actually was, they've also got her just giving William a cup of tea while he does all the hard work on a mirror. And that's just not what happened. Yeah, yes, yeah, she did bring him tea and feed him, but she was the one getting her elbows in and doing the grinding as well. So this, this photograph always really winds me up because it's not fair. But there was a lot in William's obituaries when he did finally die. Um, a lot of the stuff in his obituary was talking about how amazing she was. And in the Gentleman's Magazine, um, it states that William was assisted in his observations by his excellent sister, whose indefatigable and unhesitating devotion in the performance of a task usually deemed incompatible with female habits. So even when they're saying what an amazing woman she was, this isn't normally compatible with females. So let's undermine the compliment we've just paid to somebody. Now, the president of the Royal Society, president of the Royal Society, said that Caroline had advanced the science she cultivated with so much success through perseverance, stoicism, and importantly, through ambition and a lifelong desire for independence. And she did get that in the end. She ended up being given a salary to keep doing her job, which, which is amazing. And that really did change things. It changed the landscape for everybody. There's another lady as well from a similar time period, and that's Wang Zeni. She's somebody else that was taught astronomy by her grandfather, and she also taught medicine, maths, and other subjects by her father as well. So her dad and her granddad between them gave her a very, very well-rounded education indeed. Now, she studied lunar eclipses using models that she built in her garden. So I'd, I'd love to see what she actually did. That would be really good fun to, to recreate. But she actually wrote 12 books on maths and astronomy. And this is a name that just wasn't that familiar to me as well until I started doing this research. So she has a crater on Venus named after her. It was named in 1994, but because we can't see the surface of Venus from Earth, I, I don't have a photograph of it because it will be hidden by the clouds. But it's really good that she did get a crater on Venus named after her. Now, in the 1800s, women were not only forbidden from getting a university education, but they were forbidden from using libraries because male classicists feared women would be corrupted by the shocking stories and filthy words from classical authors. Um, yeah, I'd like to put one of those guys into my mum's furniture factory that I used to work in on a Saturday and listen to the shocking stories and filthy words that I used to hear. Um, it hasn't corrupted me, I don't think I'm fine. This idea that women were so weak that they would be corrupted by literature is just extraordinary. Now, Cheltenham Ladies College used to teach physics and astronomy, but women were not able to graduate until Bedford College in London and Lady Margaret Hall in Oxford were founded. But even then, once those undergrad courses were originally offered in these institutes, people still couldn't graduate until much, much later in history. So it was baby steps, but this is a photograph of Bedford College at the University of London, and this is um, Lady Margaret Hall. And also soon after that, St Hilda's was founded in Oxford as well. Now, the Edinburgh Seven in 1869 became the first group of matriculated undergraduate women to study at any British university. So these were medical students and they were accepted as undergraduate. That's what matriculated means. I'd never heard that word until two years ago. But when you officially become an undergrad student, you have matriculated. And these women were able to study medicine at 
a British university in Edinburgh, but they were not able to graduate or qualify as a doctor at the end of it, despite doing all of the, the, the exams and all of the studying and all the hard work. And you got to wonder whether they must have been such motivated individuals to do that. And when Lady Margaret Hall was, um, say, one of the early places in Oxford to actually admit women, but they couldn't graduate until 1920. So they were running for a lot of years without people actually coming out of it with a degree. And in 1880, four women actually graduated for the first time in the UK at the University of London. 1880 doesn't feel that long ago, and it's, it's quite shocking. But this is the crucial thing here. To go to one of these universities cost a lot of money. So the family of the lady in question is going to need to be wealthy. The lady herself was going to have to have been extremely clever and very determined to get over all the hurdles in order to go on one of these courses and then have a family that understood that once they've paid for her to do this and that she's got a degree that she might want a life beyond being a wife and mother and these women that actually did this first must have been so unbelievably driven and their families you know must have been supportive otherwise they just wouldn't have gone through it um and the working conditions as well were so shocking even afterwards now in the late 1800s we're starting to see women being employed professionally in other jobs um particularly the Harvard computers, which is one of the ones I'm going to talk about in a second. And this coincided with women getting jobs as typists, as switchboard ops, watch painters and other jobs not requiring physical strength. So these were jobs that were kind of people were starting to accept were OK for a woman to do, um, because obviously women were so weak that they couldn't possibly do any of the other sorts of jobs. Now, these jobs were considered ladylike but also ideally suited to the essentially docile female mind and temperament. Um, I've seen the videos of those old switchboard operators plugging jack leads here, there and everywhere, connecting people. That is not somebody that has a docile mind or temperament that is able to do that. The people that were doing the stuff, the Harvard computers doing the calculations were not docile female minds but this is just throughout history is what people have written about women every time something good has been achieved there has to be this underlying thing that undermines that again and it's really frustrating now most of the women doing these jobs were working in the daytime as I said so they would have been analyzing data taken the night before by men they were not expected to work at night and actually quite often women were not allowed in the observatories at all um, if you look back. Now, one of the ladies that was involved um, at Harvard was Maria Mitchell. Many of you will have heard of her. She was a phenomenal figure from history. And she was born in Nantucket to a Quaker community. And this was um, a, a, a basically a culture where people were very much into educating all of their children. So it was equality for women. All women were educated. So she had a really good start in life there. And her dad, being an amateur astronomer, was able to teach her quite a lot about astronomy. And when she was 12, she actually helped to calculate the exact time of a solar eclipse, which you know, is pretty amazing. And then she actually opened her own school in 1835. Now, she always described herself as having a normal level of activity, but with an extraordinary patience. That is probably the case of all of these women that worked throughout history. Now, she, Maria Mitchell, discovered a comet in 1847, and she was the first woman to enter the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also the American Association for the advancement of science. So yeah, she was one of the, the people that was really pivotal in kind of changing how people viewed women. Um, she also performed calculations for the US Coast Survey. And she was um, actually became a professor of astronomy at Vassar and also a director of the observatory there, teaching and doing research. Now, naturally, she was paid a way lower wage than a male would have been paid. But the fact that she was employed as a professor of astronomy is phenomenal for the time period. And she actually founded the Association for the Advancement of Women and also has a lunar crater named after her, which is up at the top here. And is this little one here. So that's quite an easy one to spot as well. Now, Elizabeth Brown um, was in, uh, another fairly well known if you have kind of studied any history of women in astronomy. Now, her dad was a keen astronomer and a meteorologist and Elizabeth was a keen assistant to her dad. And 
this is an amazing picture because she is one of the first women to actually own an observatory and it's believed she is the first woman to actually have been photographed in an observatory because as I said if you if we watched um, a talk about Cecilia Payne recently she was not allowed to work in the observatory at all in her early career so it's really good that um, I guess if you're dad builds you an observatory you're allowed to go in it but <laughs> this just wasn't the norm women were just not allowed in them so I love this picture because of what it stands for it's really good now she concentrated on solar observing and she began eclipse chasing in 1887 and this was a really common thing for women in astronomy to do in history um but Elizabeth was also elected as a fellow of the Royal Meteorological Society the first woman to have been elected one now, she once stated that many ladies have ample time at their disposal and are often skilled in the use of a pencil, meaning women are, are very well suited to do eyepiece sketches. But Elizabeth also said that the sun is a suitable subject for female study as it can be undertaken in the daytime and necessitated no exposure to the night air. Now, the Victorians regarded the night air as dangerous to the delicate female constitution. And this was a view held by women and men. And I find this extraordinary. I, I, this is a point I found in one of Alan Chapman's many books that I've read. Many eclipse chasers basically were exposed to, like, if you go traveling around the globe in the 1800s and early 1900s, you are going to be out in ocean storms. You're going to be exposed to tropical diseases. You could end up being caught in hostile attack if you just rock up at some random island. You could end up in the middle of some local uprising. Who knows what you're going to find when you just rock up to some random place across the sea somewhere and I find it extraordinary that it was accepted that this was okay but going out on a chilly night in an English garden is not okay for these delicate females I just find it really funny that yeah yeah I, I just think it's extraordinary um, I guess the Victorians were big on the miasmas coming down at night, but, you know, I just find it really, in this day and age, it's really hard to believe people actually thought that. Um, I've included this sketch here because when I went to the USA in 2017 to see the solar eclipse for our honeymoon, when I got home, um, actually Tracy Snellis, who um, you guys all know, did a sketch of her um, total eclipse thing at Solar Sphere at my desk, and it inspired me to go and do a sketch myself of um, my own eclipse clips pictures so thank you Tracy for giving me the idea to do that and when I put that sketch out online somebody sent me this saying have you seen this sketch by Mary Proctor from the eclipse in Norway in 1896 and I'd never heard of Mary Proctor and I'm so glad I can't remember who sent me this photograph but this was the sketch that I put online that and made them think of this and the similarities are, are just extraordinary and, and I'm really glad that Mary Proctor is now a name that is on my radar and wasn't before and all because of sketching so just amazing. Now Elizabeth Isis Pogson a, another phenomenal lady from history she was born in Oxford but her dad um, was the director of the Radcliffe Observatory so obviously had a, a great male mentor there but in 1860 her dad was appointed the government superintendent of the Madras Observatory so they ended up moving it to India and he worked at this um, observatory so she became his salaried assistant but for a servant's wage but you know at least she was getting paid for the work which is all steps forward and she ended up being appointed director in his place following her father's death so it's really nice to see that Madras didn't do the same thing to her that we've seen happen before where the woman gets cut loose when the father or husband or whoever dies so she ended up being the first woman to single-handedly head up a government research station which I think is phenomenal. Now famously she was refused uh, entry as a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society but eventually was elected in 1920 and I'm going to talk about that in a second but I also wanted to briefly mention Wilhelmina Patton Stevens Fleming because she was born in Dundee and emigrated to Boston when she was 21. Now she had a young son and her husband abandoned the two of them and so she ended up getting work as a maid for Professor Edward Charles Pickering who was the director of Harvard College Observatory at the time and he obviously 
obviously saw intellect in this lady because he was very famously would complain that my Scottish maid could do better. And in the end, he did hire her to do some admin work at the observatory. And then in 1881, she actually formally joined the observatory to work for him. And he ended up teaching her to analyze stellar spectra, and she was the founding member of the Harvard Computers. Now, this was you know, quite a common thing. These intelligent women were there. There were no actual physical computers at the time, so human computers would sit and do all of these calculations. Now, obviously, that didn't involve a lot of heavy work, so it seemed suitable for, for women that had the intellect to carry that out. And here again, we see this undermining of this amazing achievement by him being called Pickering's Harem. And you know, it's so insulting. Um, but anyway, she ended up working on the stellar classification system that we all use today. So you no, know, she was pretty amazing. And she also famously discovered um, 59 nebulae, over 300 variable stars, 10 novae, and the first white dwarf star, all of this on photographic plates, of course. So this is my sketch of the Horsehead Nebula in mono and colour. And uh, I just wanted to include that as a you know most astronomers' favourite nebula object, I would say. And um, we all love the Horsehead very much, and it was Wilhelmina that found it. And so that was probably her most notable discovery. Now, she did publish a lot of her work. Um, Henrietta Swan Leavitt was born in Massachusetts, and she got a bachelor's degree in 1892. Now, she also began working as a Harvard computer, and she was measuring and cataloguing star magnitudes on photographic plates. So they were doing slightly different things. But it was um, Henrietta Swan Leavitt that discovered this really vital period luminosity relationship of Cepheid variable stars, which we now use as standard candles and uh, cosmology would be lost without standard candles. So this was actually work that was published and signed by Pickering, but he clearly states within it that it was her work. So he made sure that she was credited for that. Now, the late 1800s, we saw the rise of amateur astronomical societies, the oldest being Liverpool Astronomical Society. And the membership, um, when you look back through history, there was around 10 to 20 percent female membership in the amateur astronomy society. So there's always been a good female contingent um, kind of on an amateur basis. Now, quite often the members would have been fairly well off professionals and they would have been writers or teachers themselves. They were willing to travel quite great distances to go to these meetings and it's really interesting when you kind of pick through some of the the trends in membership but there's definitely a lot of females that have been involved at an amateur level for a very long time now the BAA was founded in 1890 and um, partly by Elizabeth Brown and women were admitted and on the governing council from the very very start so that's really good and um, I did the sky notes presentation for their January meeting in 2020 and I was absolutely gobsmacked when I found out I was the first female to have done the sky notes and while I'm truly honoured that my name will go down as that I was quite surprised that given how many females I know on the speaker circuit that nobody else had been approached to do that before I did it um you know I mean it's just extraordinary because the BAA have you know always had a very kind of friendly attitude towards female membership but um, yeah, they've always been on the governing council and also a lot of the um, section directors have been women from the early days as well. Now, I want to put something into context here. The Harvard computers were working seven hour days, six days a week for 25 cents per hour. In London, we had the Greenwich Lady Computers. Um, Astronomer Royal William M. Christie employed lady computers. Now, in order to get a job being a Greenwich Lady Computer, you had to be a graduate. So as we saw before, that meant you had to have a very wealthy family. You needed to have great professional aspirations and be very driven. And so it's really quite astonishing when you find out that the women had to have gone through all of that and got a degree but they were working alongside boys that came straight from school without any qualifications whatsoever doing the same work so the women have had to achieve such a high level of education 
which would have been completely unachievable to people that didn't have a lot of money behind them. And then they were working alongside boys that have just been picked from school that couldn't do anything else. It's just really extraordinary to me. But they were only paid four pounds a month for doing this as well, also doing very long hours. And Christie did try to improve paying conditions for them to give him his due. But you know, this, this was just the lot of a professional lady back then. Now, this lady was somebody that Alan Chapman pointed out in um, his book, one of one of many Alan Chapman books that I've read, and that's Annie Walker from Cambridge. And the reason that he brings this up is very little is known about her, but age 15, she was employed by the university as a general junior assistant. And during the time that she was um, working there for 10 years, she had a salary increase from £40 a year to £100 a year. And that was actually on a par with a man's salary. And that basically made her the most senior and the most well-paid female astronomer in history. And until I'd read that book, Annie Walker was somebody I'd never heard of either. Um, possibly Land Rover's Return landlady, if I remember rightly. But um, yeah, showing my age there, Coronation Street as a child. But she's thought to be only the second female professional astronomer known to observe at night after Caroline. But as we saw earlier, the kind of very early females that were working in astronomy that not kind of paid for it were definitely already working at night but it really wasn't expected that these women were going to do nighttime observations now all of the women that i've talked about already deserve an hour's talk of their own every one of the women on screen now deserve an hour all of their own and basically that there are just so many phenomenal women throughout the history of astronomy and there are more that aren't on my screen now and they all just deserve so much love. Now, the Royal Astronomical Society, as I mentioned, Isis Pogson's father um, proposed his daughter was elected a fellow, and she was famously turned down for that. And the reason for that was a legal quibble over a male pronoun in the founding charter. And eventually that was changed. But um, there was um, a I think it was 1916 they um, did actually change that and women could be elected fellows but they did um a, a, was it a study somewhere where the guys within the astronomical society were basically saying if we let women enter then it's all we need is some violins and we'll spend the night dancing around while we listen to the papers and this kind of really undermining again the fact that women were allowed to be in the royal astronomical society um but yeah not surprising that that was the view of some of their members now it was 1947 before cambridge university becomes the last university to allow women to take full degree 1947 that's really not that long ago um it wasn't until 1975 the sex discrimination act was passed in the uk but it, in 1979 was the time when women were very first admitted to queen's college oxford i think they were the last college to finally allow women well i was six then the thought that at six years old and already loving astronomy that I would not have been allowed to study at Queen's College because I was female is just extraordinary to me and as a child it would have totally blown my mind because this is just not something I'd encountered at that age. Now a while ago Jocelyn Bell Burnell who we all adore um, did a talk for Oxford University Physics Department about challenges and changes in physics this is on YouTube, so I please urge you to find this video and watch it because it really tells the story from her perspective of what it was like for her trying to study and make her way in such a male dominated environment. One of the things that really stood out for me here was the fact that in the first year they took on loads of people with the intention that most people would drop out. So in her honours physics class, by the time we, they got to that stage, she was the only female in a 50 person class and there was a tradition at the University of Glasgow that when a female entered a room or spoke at all in class to ask a question all the men would whistle stamp their feet stamp the desks cat call and that was really really horrible and basically the women for other courses would wait for each other outside the room and go in together because it, you know, it's just really undermining um, but obviously she couldn't do that because she was the only female and lots of people assumed that she would change subjects 
Um, thankfully, she didn't. But there are so many things in this talk that she talked about in, in this lecture, and it's just it's really heartbreaking because this isn't really that long ago at all. She mentions as well the fact that when she discovered pulsars, there was obviously a lot of media attention. The media would talk to her supervisor, Anthony, and they would ask him all the technical stuff. They would go to her and ask her what her bra size was, ask her what her bra hips waist measurement was, how does her bra size compare to Princess Margaret's? And when they came to photographs, they were asking her to unbutton her shirt lower. And, and this is astonishing. This is not that long ago, really, in history. And she just kind of put up with all of this and you know, did it with such humility. And this was an example of the Matilda effect as well, the whole thing around the um, discovery of pulsars. And this is um, the bias against acknowledging the achievement of women whose work is attributed to their male colleagues. Examples of this, Cecilia Payne, in her doctoral thesis, one of the comments was this was undoubtedly the most brilliant thesis ever written in astronomy. And that's because she concluded in it that the sun was comprised of hydrogen. And we did not know this at the time. Obviously, this is common knowledge now, but we didn't know this at the time. Her supervisor, Henry Norris Russell, persuaded her to remove that conclusion. And then a few years later, claimed that discovery for himself. So this is a classic example of the Matilda effect. And this happened not just in astronomy, but it happened all the way through sciences in general. If you just dig through every single science history, that this happened all the time. And Jocelyn Bell Bunnell, obviously, we all know that she discovered pulsars, but the Nobel Prize was given to her supervisor, and it was said to be one of the most significant scientific achievements of the century. Now, she always is, is very fine about this if ever she's asked about it which must be every talk she ever does but basically part of this was because it was just the supervisor was the person that was given the award that's just the etiquette of what happened at the time how much of that is true I don't know what I haven't done is gone back and had a look at other um kind of Nobel Prize winners to see whether a male student that found um, a Nobel Prize winning thing was um, then credited to their supervisor. I need to go back and do that. But at least history has been put straight. Now, we all know that it was her that um, discovered it. Also, Tim Peake. Tim Peake is a lovely guy. I adore all of the outreach that has gone on over his time on the space station and all the stuff with schools. It's absolutely amazing. Yet the Guardian and the Observer, um, when they put this out in 2014, said the first Brit in space, Tim Peake. Um, I beg to differ because this lady was not only the first female in space, but the first Britain in space full stop when she spent eight days in space in 1991. And I find it ironic that the Guardian were the people that last year wrote an article about the forgotten people of astronomy and space age. I mean, this talk is not about space flight because they're, they're, that's an entire subject all of its own. But this was a classic example of the whole of the world forgetting the fact that Helen Sharman had been to space long before Tim Peake had probably even been born. So how do we fix this problem? And it's a difficult one to fix. And positive discrimination is definitely not the answer because as a female myself, none of us want to feel we've been given a talk opportunity or a job opportunity because we're a woman. You want to get it off your own merit. And also if a female gets a job because they're a female, then there's um, all the male colleagues then start to get funny about it as well. And it just creates tension and nobody wants that. Absolutely nobody wants that. What we do need to do is recognize this unconscious bias, which clearly does exist. And, and I do believe it is unconscious a lot of the time, although there are still people that are very misogynistic within astronomy world. For the most part, everybody that I've ever met in my years of, of an amateur astronomer has been supportive of women in astronomy. So there's an unconscious bias there and this needs to be fixed. One of the things that was going to really help that in terms of getting females up into more senior roles is better childcare facilities and affordable childcare facilities. And this is something that Jocelyn Bell Bunnell talks about in that lecture that I, I mentioned. One of the things that Jocelyn, together with a group of other female academics, put together was the Athena Swan Award. And this basically recognised female friendliness rather than positive discrimination to women. People 
um, before you could apply for certain grants, you had to show that you'd reached at least a silver award in the female friendliness thing. And they looked at various different things. And ironically, the women in the department generally got lumbered with all the paperwork. But it, it kind of set up a bit of a a bit of a competitive buzz between the supervisors because they all wanted to be female friendly and all the rest of it so this was a really positive step forward and it looked like it was having a good effect but recently the government have just overturned the rule that means that when you apply for certain funding that you had to have this as a compulsory thing so that's a huge step backwards and it's a real shame but I hope something like this kind of rears up again so how are the how does the UK compare with the rest of the world now as of this is percentage female membership of the International Astronomy Union done by country as of June 2020 and you can see that the world average is 19% the UK are down here at 13% so kind of joint second to last place not the best to be honest and there's a lot of work going on in a lot of parts of the world that are trying to tackle this disparity and the Netherlands apparently have done a, a female only recruitment thing for certain jobs within the lab. So they've really pushed up their female kind of job applications because of having these female only roles. How that will pan out over the long term will remain to be seen, but it's a really difficult thing to fix. And we clearly are not getting it right in the UK at the moment. Now I'm going to finish just, this is a bit of fun really, but I, I just want to, I, I've been thinking long and hard over the years about why it is that I had this attitude that I can do anything. And it's not just because I had supportive parents and supportive everybody. But I think it's just about my mental state in many ways. And part of the reason for that, I think, is when I was, obviously I grew up in, my memories are from the late 70s, early 80s. And I remember having so many positive female role models on telly and in films. And Space 1999 is one of my earliest memories of favorite TV shows. And we had Helen, who was amazing. There was some amazingly, powerful females within the music industry there were like obviously we had wonder woman and the bionic woman but we also had jill gascoigne being a female detective there was the charlie's angels sorting stuff out and it was just cagney and lacy even all of this stuff was just women that were doing male dominated things and i think it just seeing that gives you this idea that i too can do absolutely anything that i set my mind to and I think that's important. Today's female role models are hypersexualized superheroes in a lot of cases. And there was a study done that has actually proven that this has a worse impact on a young girl's mental state than a damsel in distress kind of classic situation that we usually see in old films. And we need to move away from the girls cannot relate to this. Like a, a, a 12 year old girl does not have this body shape, probably never will, um, because a lot of this is CGI and cause a tree and, you know, whatever. These people, I think, are amazing female role models. And this is just a few. I think I know Star Trek Discovery has kind of split the crowd a bit. But in terms of strong female role models, they kicked it out of the park and then some. Ray from Star Wars and also um, Rogue One, also excellent female leads. Having the Doctor as a female, I know, again, split the crowd, but it gave young girls something that they could kind of be they gave them something that they related to because this is a more relatable kind of character um as much as disney princess stuff makes me want to vomit um at least with frozen the whole point of the story wasn't that they were damsels in distress saved by the prince it was about sisterly love so it wasn't this you're only going to get there if you marry the prince so it actually was a big step forward and i hope there's a lot more of that and just as an example here one of my friend's daughters was the doctor at solar sphere she wasn't dressed up as the doctor she literally was the doctor for the entire weekend and awesome at it she was another of my friend's daughters dressed as ray this young girl had never found a female that she related to until she'd seen star wars and 
once she met Ray on the screen, she wanted to dress up as her and wore this outfit to death. She just loved it. So don't underestimate the importance of these female role models. And I think those of us that are women amateurs, it's important that if ever we get the opportunity to do stuff, particularly with children, I always try to say yes, because you never know, there might be a young girl in a class of boys that think she's weird for liking science, but you might be the person that makes her think, do you know what, I'm going to go for it. Whether you know it or not, you might be unconsciously biasing somebody. And those of you that have young relatives who have young daughters or their nieces, nephews, grandchildren, just support them if they are showing the geeky side and show them that that's okay as well. Now, one thing that's really hit this problem, I think, hard was the fact that gender stereotyping in marketing massively increased since the 70s. So I think because I didn't watch an awful lot of TV in the 80s, I, I probably missed the change over here. So toys were just toys to me as a child. When home computers were first marketed, they were marketed to boys and instantly overnight it affected the number of female computer science graduates and coders. So this does have an effect. And as much, I'm not a fan of this kind of word cloud type stuff, but the Let Toys Be Toys campaign actually did some research. A bunch of people sat and watched the children's TV shows on um, commercial channels and just looked at all the stuff that was marketed to boys and it's adventure launch control rescue battle power boom explore but also technology and learning are in there whereas the stuff marketed to females is all fun and hair and glitter and awesome and all of the princess kind of stuff nowhere at all on any of the stuff marketed at females is there anything about learning or technology so the let toys be toys campaign tried to address this and it launched in 2012 and in one year there was a 60% reduction in girls and boys signs in stores. As an adult I don't care whether something's labelled boy or a girl but if you're a young child who's not quite sure of your way in the world and you see something marketed as a girl's thing then you're not going to play with it because your friends will pick on you and the other way around as well. So it, it's kind of okay for women to end up in medical fields because it's a caring profession but why can't boys play with dolls they're going to look after children when they're older and get married as well so we need to get away from this constant gender stereotyping and the same as well with clothing space pajamas are for boys as well as girls you know they're, they're just children's but it, I actually trawled around a few clothing sites and in the sleepwear section in particular if you saw in the girls section some pajamas with space on they were children's pajamas but if you go to the boys section they're boys space pajamas and again we need to get away from this girls love space shuttles and coding and all of that stuff and I think it's great that Mattel have started to address this we've got robotics engineer Barbie we've got astronaut Barbie we had astrophysicist Barbie astronomer Barbie all absolutely amazing but also other kind of male dominated professions like airline pilot and footballer so this is good we need more of that we also need to see more women in the media doing science stuff but not like this because <laughs> this is one of those famous pictures of how not to hold a soldier in iron they've just grabbed a female off the street who's clearly never seen a circuit board before and by trying to show a woman doing what would be a typical male or dominated job we've made it 10 times worse because the woman if she held it like that she's not going to have a lot of fingertips left so as somebody that does a lot of soldering I can vouch for you never want to hold a soldier iron quite like that so it's important that we kind of address this at every level and having women presented properly is important as well. Now I took over running the UK Women in Astronomy Network a few years ago from Sue and Andrew um, from Astro Farm. It hasn't had a lot of my attention lately but we do just try to share inspiring stories and Brian Jones shares all the historical stuff there for us. So we just try to showcase women that are doing this from an amateur and a professional level. We've got the um, Twitter handle. If anyone tags us with their female astro pics, we always retweet it there. And also there is a, a female astrophotography Flickr group. Aside from that, there isn't much more that we're doing with this at the moment, but 
definitely just head over to the social media there. But there are also some amazing kind of you know good female kind of groups like this to follow online there's um th there's just loads of them so try and find some of those as well because they they may be just the inspiration someone that you know needs these are the people that inspire me today these are some phenomenal science communicators that i adore and there are many more otherwise but while I love these guys, I just want to say thank you to these women, because these are the women that did the hard stuff to pave the way for us to be able to do what we do today as females. So I'll stop talking because I'm sure I've overrun again <laughs> and I will um, take any questions. Sorry, yeah, hour and a half. Sorry, I do this. <laughs> Brilliant as always, uh, Mary. And uh, we don't mind you overrunning, which is always enjoyable. So. <laughs> sit there and waffle all night i'll just sit here and listen so yeah any questions for mary please uh ask away